and we're just gonna wait another minute or so to let everyone join us who wants to. So while we're just waiting, um, we're just going to go through over a little bit about um, uh, do's and don'ts um, for the day. I don't know, Chiara, do you want to do that? Sure. So um, we've just shared the code of conduct in the chat box. So if everyone could just have a quick look at that. Um, and this session will be recorded, just to let you know. Um, please do mute your microphone when the speaker is talking, um, unless you know, you're asking questions. And do put your questions and answers in the chat box, please. I think that's everything, Kate. Fantastic. We'll get cracking then. So I should introduce myself. My name is Kate Robson Brown, and I'm the director of the Gene Golding Institute for Data Science and Data Intensive Research at the University of Bristol which is one of the university research institutes here at the University of Bristol, which are tasked with developing multidisciplinary research communities that break down the silos between um, faculties and build external partnerships as well. Um, it's a real delight to be able to kick off Bristol Data Week. We've been looking forward to this week. We've had a busy couple of weeks. We had our, our showcase, our data science and AI showcase, uh, last week down at the M Shed, which is the science, one of the science museums in the, um, in the city of Bristol, down on the harbour side. And it's great to be able to have this five days uh, with you, um, celebrating data science and providing some training. So first of all, just a little bit of background. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Slido and there's the code. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat box as well. Um, so for some of you, some of you may be long-standing friends of the Gene Golding Institute, but there is always a few new people on these calls. So it's a good idea, I think, to introduce what we do and give you a sense of how you can engage. So um, the Gene Golding Institute um, has four main pillars of activity. These are our key uh, priorities. And those are the verticals you see on this infographic here, societal challenges, uh, data visualization, reproducibility and data governance and fundamental or foundational research. And we deliver those um, activities through a series of cross-cutting programs that are the pink arrows, the horizontal pink arrows that you see on this infographic. Um, so for example, developing communities, events such as this, we also offer training and professional development activities throughout the year. We're also the portal for the University of Bristol's partnership with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, and we participate with them in a number of activities. Um, uh, for example, AI UK, which is um, a, a national showcase for data science and AI. Um, and um, within the Alan Turing Institute, I also chair the Research and Innovation Advisory Committee. So I'm part, in a sense, part of their management team. Could somebody, we've got someone with uh, uh, who's unmuted, I think. If you could all make sure you're muted, that would be great. Thank you. Not sure who it is. Thank you very much. Um, and then the last one you see there, the last horizontal is our Ask JGI service. So we run a kind of surgery service where anyone um, in the university can um, send us a query, a data science query, and we will do our best to triage it and give a useful response. The team is um, kind of relatively small. We've got sort of, sort of fractionally about 15 people working in the team at the moment. Our manager, as you see here, is, is John Newby. Kiara Singh is our Institute Development Associate and on this call today. Um, Nat um, Felby is one of our data scientists. And then we have Elaine Young, our, our coordinator, Tamara Pullinger, who's our administrator and PA, and Emma Kuertz and James Thomas, who are two data scientists. Um, we also co-manage the uh, research software engineering team. Um, the direct manager for that is Christopher Woods. And currently in that team, we have Matt Williams, um, who is a research software engineer and trainer, Lester Hedges, who's a research software engineer, and Al Tanner, who is a research, research software engineer. Um, we have a steering group as well, which engages across the university. Um, so these are positions which are, are on, taken up on a rolling basis. So it, they're about two years long. And we try always to have a cross section of um, people from different discipline backgrounds mm -hmm. representing different faculties 
um, and also different career stages. If it's really important to get the views of, of researchers working in these fields from all kind of um, career stages. So every, everyone from um, early career researchers all the way through to the most senior professors. So this is the team that we're working with at the moment. And we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your continued support, particularly over the last two years. Uh, when of course things have been much more difficult for everybody. So how can the JGI um, help you in your work? Uh, we, we reach out in a number of, using a number of mechanisms that you can see on the slide here. So for example, every year we have a competition for seed corn funding. That's, that's relatively small pots of funding up to 5,000 pounds. And the purpose of that funding is to generate early stage support, particularly for collaborative research and particularly where those collaborations are kind of untried and tested or um, uh, have the participation of people from very different disciplines. So it's truly interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. The deadline is late autumn. Um, and we're, so we're expecting a deadline for this year in November. And, and I have, um, some examples of some of the projects that we funded over the past year or so to give you a sense of what might be possible. So that's one mechanism. Um, as I said, we have our, our data science and AI kind of surgery service, which we call Ask JGI. Um, so this is a, um, an, a portal via email or through our Slack, where you can ask our triage team a query. Um, we will try to resolve it um, within about a two week turnaround getting back, get back in touch with you. Occasionally it takes a little bit more work than that. Um, and sometimes projects actually develop out of those um, inquiries. So we have uh, several projects that we're running at the moment in collaboration with our partners within the, within the faculties, which have developed directly out of those Ask JGI queries, which is always great to see. Um, so in a sense, we, we also offer a consultancy with a small C to researchers within the university and also increasingly with their external partners. So those partners might be businesses, companies, they might be policymakers, they might be people in NGO and NGOs. Those external partnerships can come in many forms, um, but we also provide that kind of help and support and maybe even fractional engagement in, in projects okay. through, that, uh, through that service. Every year we run data competitions and I've got an example in a slide or two that gives you indication of that. Um, but sometimes these are short, sharp competitions. So for example, we recently ran our annual beauty of data competition, which is provides um, a kind of small prize and runner up, runners up prizes for the best data communication, kind of data visualization and realization projects from the previous year. Um, and we, but we also run much larger projects. So for example, this academic year we supported a partnership with the Met Office, as many of you will know, University of Bristol is one of six Met Office academic partners. Um, and so we co we co produced a hackathon with them that lasted several days. So these can come in different forms. And if there's something that you're interested in working up as a hackathon, we're always delighted to, to hear from you. I talked about our partnership with the Alan Turing Institute and our engagement with external partners. And the last one on that list there is data science training. So in addition to all the training that you'll see available in Data Week this week, and I've got a slide in a moment that highlights some of that, um, we do actually run data science training um, in fits and starts throughout the year. Um, and we're particularly interested in hearing from um, communities within the university who, who would like to develop particular um, training uh, activities. So we, we very often work with individual groups. For example, we've got something coming up next year with the, with the arts faculty to look at how to, to help them develop some digital humanities, data science training, um, training needs and, um, and help to upskill or provide opportunities for postgraduate research students as well. So um, these are all the kind of key ways that JGI can, can help you. And if you've got queries about any of those opportunities, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. I thought it might be useful just to give a few examples of some of the work um, that we do. I mentioned the showcase. I was rapidly putting together this slide yesterday, trying to pull together some of the photographs. We're going to have some more photographs. So these are all from our own, our own phones from, from last week. Um, but we were absolutely delighted that there was so much enthusiasm um, for this event. 
that the showcase is kind of slightly differently from day to week. The showcase is directed really towards uh, our, our city partners, um, our work as a civic partner within the city um, and um, to demonstrate the ways in which data science and AI research can have impact in sense of shared societal challenges. So uh, we're really looking for, a kind of, it's a public um, engagement opportunity here. And that was where we decided to host it down at the M Shed, the science museum down in the harbour side, run by Bristol's museums and galleries. Um, so on the left there, you can see that great photo of um, a very full auditorium. We had um, speakers throughout the day, in addition to exhibits. So we had 17 speakers, we had about 30 exhibits, um, and all in all, we had the research of about 90, 90 researchers showcased during that day and, and the afternoon of, of Monday as well. We had a, a panel with a, um, a mixed uh, panel of internal senior academics from Bristol and also invited speakers. So Neil Lawrence, from University of Cambridge, um, Hannah Fry from um, UCL. And so it has some really lively debates there, which was fantastic. And that photograph there is the vice chancellor introducing us all. Um, but we also held workshops. So the workshop you can see with the round tables and the picture on the right is um, on a, one of our data hazards workshop, which is being developed by our data scientist, Nat uh, Zelenko, and you can see her, her there at the podium. Uh, so we're also taking the opportunity to have some quite in-depth structured conversations as well with, um, with the people of Bristol. Um, now we did, we did try and count how many people were coming. We kind of lost count at about a thousand, I think. So it's, there was definitely more than that in the day. Um, and we've had a lot of great response um, from the community as well and the follow up conversations with, with several people, which I suspect will be ongoing for some time. So we don't run a showcase every, every year. Uh, this one had actually been, been delayed for two years because of the pandemic. Um, but we aim to do it maybe every three years uh, in, in, in principle, because that gives time, us time to have turnover uh, of the work. We have a number of international collaborations. So for example, with um, the Institute of Statistical Mathematics in Japan, and um, this, this was um, spearheaded by colleagues in computer science and, and mathematics um, here at the university. And we've run several uh, workshops. Um, they were intended to be all in person before, before lockdown. We've, we've pivoted towards more online activities and that, but that has been um, really, really productive and really successful. Um, and this, the second one is with Strathmore University Data Center in Nairobi in, in Kenya. Um, and this has provided a really, some really great opportunities for to developing pathways to impact for researchers at the university. So for example, we have collaborative projects um, with the VET school, with external partners within the UK, Rothamsted Research, the Institute, the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI, and the Alan Turing Institute to go to co-develop some some projects and research projects with them. Um, we've also helped to support one of their data scientists within, within their team as well to work on activities to be delivered um, at this uh, data week in Strathmore and last data week also for, for Bristol. So those are, those are some kind of really productive international partnerships and um, we'll be thinking about new ways which, which we can engage with both of our partners next year as hopefully we move back towards a more kind of more in-person opportunities. So the CECORN funding, lots of people ask me after these kinds of introductory talks, what kind of, <coughs> what kind of opportunities um, our CECORN funding um, program can, can offer. Um, so over the past four years or so, we've funded uh, 42 um, projects and they're spread across the faculties. We have, we have more engagement from some discipline areas than others, as you can see from, from here. Um, so a lot from health, for example, um, fewer from social sciences and arts, but we're trying to develop that um, and get, get some more activities going with, with colleagues there next year, which is really exciting. Um, we also, for the first time, ran a postgraduate competition in 2020, and we've repeated that this year. We had a fallow year in 21 for obvious reasons, but we've repeated that. Um, this year, we've got some great projects uh, on the go with a number of, of postgraduate research students. So to give you a sense of some of those projects, um, here, are the, here are the titles and um, PI names of, of the projects which we supported this year through, um, through CECOM funding and are, are, are going on. And you can see, I'm not gonna read these all out, but you can see from these that we've got a really great mixture of, of kind of challenge areas, um, but also 
multidisciplinary collaborations. So we've got some which are very focused on health and healthcare challenges, um, some which are more urban analytics and, and kind of city partnership based. Uh, we've got the really interesting one down the bottom there, which is using natural language processing to examine, kind of do a deep reading and examine um, texts from classical texts, in this case, the plays of, of Sophocles. And that's been a really interesting project to work through with the collaborators who come from very different um, backgrounds. And, um, and also it's been really great to see the response from the classics community to that kind of work as well, the very positive response. So we hope to be able to support more of that kind of work in the future. And here's a, here's a few more just to give you a sense. Um, the network, the Brunel Network Interactive with Maria Pregnolato from um, Civil Engineering here in Bristol. That's been a really exciting one to be working on. That's again, a really good public, in, with a public engagement spin, um, city facing public engagement spin. Um, but equally, we've been working with um, fairly early career scholars. So for example, Dr. Zahra Abdallah there on the bottom of that list, who's in engineering mathematics working very closely with clinicians to develop new tools um, to investigate um, biomarkers associated with, with dementia. So a real, a real range of topics, and I, and I hope you can get a sense from that, how wide we cast our net in terms of what we can, the kind of projects that we can support here at, here at JGI. Um, competition, so I said that we, we manage a, we kind of fund and manage a competition, data competition every year. Um, just to give you a sense of what the, what some of them are like, um, we we always engage with an external partner uh, for those competitions. In the past, we've worked with Bristol City Council. Uh, we've worked with the Alan Turing Institute to deliver. We've worked with um, the Royal College of GPs on a blood pressure project. And this was one that we ran quite recently with the Food Standards Agency. Um, and it was won actually by a PhD student, Robert Eyre, Robert Eyre from Engineering Maths. And this was, a, this was a really interesting one because it takes about six months to develop um, a, data, a data science uh, competition like this. So we work, we identify a data scientists to engage with the external partner. They curate, they co-curate a data set together to knock it into shape, to make it open. We need to be able to make these data sets open. Um, and then we, we, we open it out with an information day very often, um, which explains the kind of the parameters of the challenge that are being set by the external partner. And, and then we have, a, we have a number, we have a period of time for, for people to, to engage with that either as individuals or in teams. And then we have um, the competition side of things um, and a panel which um, selects the winner. And in this case, um, uh, Robert was able to present part, part of the package of the win, you can see, see, see what I mean, was, was to actually present the results to the FSA. Um, and, and they were, they put on their own event to engage with him around the visualization. And I know that that has generated kind of internal policy change with some of their visualization tools, but also an ongoing conversation between FSA and the researchers um, in the team. So um, the, yeah, the purpose of these, of these competitions is to give people an opportunity to explore data that they may not have been able to, to access before. It gives a mechanism of engagement with external partners, in this, in this case, um, an agency. Um, and it also ans answers a, a, a challenge from that, from that sector as well. So it gives, it gives researchers uh, an opportunity to build that pathway to impact. And also for an early career researcher, hopefully it gives some CV points as well, which as we know is always, it's always useful in people's careers. So the next um, uh, competition that we are developing is with um, uh, the or Ordnance Survey. Uh, and we've been developing that again over really about the past year, we've been having conversations with them. And um, so we're really looking forward to, to, to that competition. And it's a kind of, it's a sort of mapping, um, a mapping challenge. And you'll hear more about that soon. Um, in addition to, to those kinds of projects, we also have ongoing research support, which we deliver throughout the year. And I just thought it would be useful to highlight a few of these so that um, 
if you do sign up to our mailing list, which I hope you do, if you haven't already, you'll see these and feel like this is something that you might be able to participate in. So for example, we co-produce um, a seminar series, the JGI Heilbronn Data Science Seminars. Um, the Heilbronn Institute, for those of you who don't know, is an institute within uh, mathematics here at the University of Bristol in the Faculty of Science. Um, and these are, these are talks given by very high profile data scientists and mathematicians. Um, before lockdown, they were, they were kind of semi-residential, so people would be invited over for a few days. They would give our seminar. They would probably also talk to postgraduate research students. Um, and we use this as a mechanism for, for building collaborations between the invited speaker and, um, and the University of Bristol. We've pivoted a little bit more to, to online, and I think going forward next year, we'll have some kind of hybrid um, a mode of delivery for this. We also have a data visualization interest group um, run by James Thomas, one of our data scientists in JGI. Um, and this is a regular meetup um, open to anybody interested. When I say data visualization, I should probably actually say sort of realization because it's not always grass on a page. It could be other, other manifestations of data communication, um, whether that is you know, VR, for example, or um, in our beauty of data, data competition, one of the successful uh, um, entries was actually a, a, a composition piece that was um, that was communicating uh, kind of genomic evolution, genomic sequence evolution. So we're exploring all those kinds of different ways of communicating uh, the results of data analysis. Uh, so do come along if you're interested in those kinds of that aspect of, of, um, of data science. Um, we're very interested in the kind of societal benefit and social challenge end of, of data science, as, as, as you know from our, from our four uh, pillars. Uh, so we have a couple of ongoing activities that also support that element. We have a data ethics club um, that runs regularly, and that's run by Nat um, Zelenka. And that's a place where people can come together. Um, it sometimes acts as a reading group. It sometimes acts as a kind of position statement writing group. Um, it can also be a place where people can trial presentations or conferences that they're going to give. And it's just bringing people together to talk about the issues around um, data ethics. And one of the things that arose out of that wider activity that we, um, that we support is, uh, is a project that um, Nat Zelenka is also um, running, which is called um, Data Hazards. And, and in this project, we are um, we're trying to create a a mechanism and a vocabulary to allow people to talk about the hazards associated with the data science that they do, and also to think about mitigating strategies for that. So it is both, it is both a process and um, a train the trainer opportunity. Uh, we ran, Nat ran um, one, of the, one of her kind of um, workshop experiences at the showcase, and we're going to be running um, several more um, over, over the next year. Um, something new for this year um, was a kind of broadening out of our of our training material through the year. So we we always co-produce uh, research software engineering training with our ACRC colleagues, um, but we've also had a project to develop and um, some data science and lecture modules um, that run alongside the scientific computing um, training in the Faculty of Science. So this is this is this is training which is. Um, uh, directed at kind of third year undergraduate level and also I think open to some to some masters and level as well um, and in particular engaging with um, physics students interested in that side of, of of the undergraduate experience so thinking about how scientific computing and analytics can be embedded um, in their in their learning around around physics so that was new for this year and I think it's been very successful so we'll be looking to, to see how we can continue to participate in those activities as well. And we are have an ongoing project to develop a handbook of best practice, uh, which is going to be a handbook of guidance, open, um, open and available to everybody. Um, so this is, there's two reasons for doing this. One, we developed really quite a lot of material over the past few years, and we thought in relation, in relation to different aspects, and we thought it would be good to put it all in, all in one place for a handbook for everybody. And secondly, because we thought it might take a little bit of heat off our Ask JGI team as well. We've got a lot of kind of frequently asked questions that come through that. We might be able to deflect by having a handbook which is already open, which everyone can, can use. 
So then for data week this week, this is just a screenshot of the interactive, the fantastic interactive that the team produced, which you can see on our on our website. Um, but to, re to really just give you a sense of the wealth of activities that are that are happening this week, and and hopefully you'll be able to find pathways for you to running running through running through those activities whether that's in terms of training you can start for example with introductory python and go all the way through to some data analytics or maybe you're interested in workshops and networking events in which case you you, you know, probably want to go for the some of the green things that are, that are going on here um, they're color coded according to the type of, of activity um, but I really hope there's something here for everybody. And if there's something that you would really like to see uh, in a data week um, next year, um, then we'll be, we'd be really keen to hear from you. We ask for feedback from all our at, from all our events, um, but you could you can write feedback without it being tied to a particular event. If there's something that you would you'd really like to see, and we're we're keen for that because we're here to serve. Um, the community of researchers within the University of Bristol and you'll as you'll see as you work through this week that, that almost all of these activities have been developed in partnership with people across the university and that's the best that's the way things should be you know we're, we're, we're here to support what you need to showcase what you do and to provide an opportunity for new networking to happen. None of this would be possible without our partners and sponsors. So just a just a quick plug for for all of them that you can you can see here today. Uh, we've got some really long-standing partnerships represented on this slide. For example, LV General Insurance. Um, we've got some really new and exciting partnerships developing. So Rosh, immediately after this talk, I'm going off to, to share. Um, the lecture and workshop with 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 Rosh at eleven o'clock. So you know that's that's a that's a relatively new partnership that's developed over the past year, and we have real high hopes for how for how that's going to go. So big thank you to to all our sponsors and all our partners that have made um, the activities that we're doing in Data Week and the activities throughout the year, in fact, um, possible. And one thing in particular that we thought might be of interest is for the second year running. This is new last year for the second year running. And the JGI is sponsoring a prize at the Bristol Science Film Festival for data science and AI films. So these are short films. They're mostly, I think, between five and 10 minutes. And we are hosting a screening and prize giving at the Watershed on Friday, I think it starts at three o'clock. Um, so we'd, like, we'd love to see you all there if you're interested in how um, film can be used as a means of interpreting the world of data science and AI for a, for, for the public, we've got fiction and non-fiction. We've got films from um, professional groups and 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 um, and non-professional filmmakers uh, all together in one space. I think it's going to be a fantastic way to, to end data week. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, um, one of the real pleasures of doing um, the introductory talk for data week is that I also get a chance to talk a little bit about something that has I felt is important over the past year uh, or something where I think you know there's an interesting conversation to be had and in the past I've talked about um, women in data science and what it means to be to be visible in leadership um, as a woman in data science I've talked about the opportunities for advocacy and the history of of humanitarian use of data science um, I've talked about new opportunities in data science from uh, data from in orbit technology. That was that was last year's. Um, and this year I thought I would talk about um, the challenges and opportunities that we face as a community of data scientists, AI specialists, in negotiating and navigating what is becoming, I think, a very crowded landscape of players and expectations for data science and AI, really specifically within, within the UK. Um, over the past three years, but I think three or four years really, but it kind of highlighted by the last two years, the experiences we've all gone through, the number of initiatives in data science and AI at a national level have, have increased and also become much more visible. And that, that I think can make it quite difficult for researchers and practitioners, and particularly actually 
people coming into these sectors for the first time to, to work out what the key messages are, where the opportunities might be for them um, going forward. So I thought this might be just quite a nice moment for us to just to think through some of those issues and think about whether there are in fact um, key messages that we can take away. Now, I, I know I've shown this, this slide before in other talks, um, but I think it's quite a useful hook. Um, we can think about data science as a life cycle, and I've divided it up, people, people divide up the life cycle in different ways. I divide it up into these five um, sections, data capture, maintenance, processing, analysis, and, and communication. Um, and, and this life cycle is, is really quite mature now as we stand here in, in 2022. For every one of those kind of sub themes there within the different parts of the, of the data flow, there's a whole industry and, and body of researchers um, working together to push the boundaries of, of what's possible and make things faster, more efficient and more targeted to, to, to challenges. Um, and, and in the UK, we can see um, lots of interest kind of popping up in different, different elements of these. And if we, if we think about that um, alongside many of the recent predictions of the importance of data science in the eye to the national economy, we can kind of see how we've got to this crowded landscape. So if we look, for example, at a, at a relatively recent, I think it's 18 months old actually, but it's a relatively recent report, this one was by, by McKinsey, the, of the projected total annual value of AI and analytics across industries. Um, we'll see that the, you know, some of these predictions are, 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 are really highly visible and very, very ambitious. Um, and, and these kinds of predictions provide a lot of energy for decision makers to engage with our, with our fields, which is, which is great and is something that should, be, that should be encouraged. But one of the things that this has done, I think, is create um, a landscape in which we have a lot of different players. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but just to give you a, an idea of the organizations that we see in the UK, who are, who are charged with driving the national agenda in, in some way. So some of these are organizations and some of them are, are, um, are kind of documents or report pieces, but we've got obviously the Alan Turing Institute, we've got the Office for AI, we've got the Ada Lovelace Institute, the CDEI, the Center for Data and Ethics, HDI UK, the Government Data Service, Office for Science and Technology, ONS, um, and UKRI, and there are there are others. I'm sure we can all think about others that might go on this brain diagram. <laughs> but but the idea here is to kind of illustrate that actually this is a this is this is a crowded landscape, um, and and all these all these organisations have documentation behind them. They have strategies. They have key priorities, um, and and the network is ever growing. So. So, so around the kind of occipital part of the brain now, down the bottom right, we've got some little notes about strategies that are developing. So I've mentioned two, but there are others. So the National AI Strategy, the National Space Strategy, there's one around defense and technology and, 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 there, and there are others. So, so working out how to navigate through this landscape is, is tricky. And I think um, one of the things that we can do is to, as a, as a data science institute like JGI, is to, to try and facilitate understanding some of the key messages. So that's that's what I that's what I try to do here. So we can try to pull messages out of this crowded space and look for common themes emerging from these organisations and strategies. So so let's just start off by by thinking about those 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 national strategies, strategies like defence, AI, and and space. What are the what are some common themes I've seen that are that are in these which kind of produced intersections that we can that we can use. So I think that one of the first common theme is um, an aspiration to unlock growth and unleash innovation in UK industry. Um, so you see you see phrases reappearing in these strategies that are like um, um, using government to unleash the potential of our industry, uh, our entrepreneurs, our innovators, uh, ambitions to ensure innovative space that businesses can access private finance through venture capital funds, supporting growth through pro-innovation business environments and capital markets, um, providing access to finance for all stages of, 
of, um, of enterprise, ensuring national governance of AI technologies are in place that will encourage that innovation and investment. And also there's, there are ambitions around protecting the public and safeguarding fundamental values within this, which I think, I think are quite interesting. So that's, that's the first one. Um, I mean, another one is translation and commercialization. So uh, there's you know, several parts of these, of these strategies and organizations from which they come have aspirations to bridge gaps between um, UK world-class research communities and commercial uh, organizations by providing access to facilities, technology, demonstrators, tools, and data platforms. So there's, there's lots of discussion about um, that kind of open or shared data platform and how that might be supported. Um, and and uh, around translation and commercialization, there's, there's an aspiration to, to support what is often always called kind of world leading UK research de development and innovation systems. Um, so that includes research translation and supporting AI startups and SMEs and scaly businesses wanting to scale up on their commercial journey. One of the interesting threads that comes through when you start looking for these connections is around standards and regulation. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in trying to develop ways of conceptualizing and implementing standards and regulation in data science and AI. Um, now, part of that is through developing relationships, research relationships, for example, with NPL within the UK. And part of that is thinking about um, how, that, how our standards might actually intersect with international standards. Uh, so there's, there's often aspirations of partnerships through bilaterals hidden within these, um, uh, these parts of, of, the, of the strategies. Uh, and, and there's also lots of discussion around trust and, and pro-innovation systems is often a phrase that's used, pro-innovation systems. So there, there, here there's, um, there's, a, there's a desire to build UK regulators coordination and capacities to use and assess AI develop a mature AI assurance ecosystem is a phrase that you see, uh, mechanisms to review and adapt to regulatory environments and a sector level approach. And then the next one on this list is leveling up. That's a phrase that we've all heard. Um, so that reappears throughout pretty much all the strategy, the recent strategy documents that I've looked at. Um, and that's about trying to get these systems to work for everybody across, across the UK. Um, there's also hints there that there may be um, development uh, supports for development of new clusters of various kinds nationally within the devolved governments, but also but also across across England. So developing clusters based on local excellence, uh, connecting them, mechanisms to connect them into a networked ecosystem, uh, and developing again kind of world leading or world class um, opportunities. Even, I mean, with the leveling up, there's also often an aspiration around finance, trying to try kind of aspirations of, of wanting to build access to finance as part of that development of those of those clusters and to stimulate the development and adoption of AI technologies in high potential and low maturity sectors as well. And part of that, of course, refers to the next one, which is skills. <clears throat> so there's a lot of interest in skills gaps for data science and AI throughout these strategies. Um, a lot of us, a lot of sense in which um, we need to understand those gaps, reform our skills system so that it better meets the needs of employers and the economy, provide better opportunities for upskilling. So, for example, the the, um, the 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 recent work that's been done uh, in the University of Bristol, developing a, a degree apprenticeships, I think is a really good example of the kind of activity that is 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 that these these strategies um, are keen on and want to want to promote but but basically this is all about guaranteeing access to a diverse range of people with the skills needed to develop ai of the future and to deploy it to meet the needs of the of this new economy and economic ecosystem that's being developed so to attract and retain the best people and firms in the uk and inspire those currently not using ai to upskill and then there are two, I think, two threads around international, international collaboration and international trade. 
So um, it's, that seems to me that there's, there seems to be, maybe this is also partly a post Brexit um, uh, challenge, but, but, uh, but there are efforts in place, I think, to, to help to develop those bilaterals, develop international partnerships, maintain our roles in international partnerships that exist, develop new ones, so collaborate internationally, forge new bilateral partnerships to solve humanity's greatest challenges was one phrase I picked out. Um, use existing pathways of, of assistance, for example, ODA, um, but also develop new ones and to work with those global partners to promote the responsible development of AI. And in some senses, I think also to set an example for safe and ethical deployments of AI as well, which is quite interesting. Um, there's lots of discussion of, of the UK as a science and technology superpower, and I put that in, um, in brackets because it's, it's, a, it's a phrase which is it's kind of coming through strongly in, in almost all the strategies I've met. Um, but this is the idea that, um, that the UK will participate, in, continue to participate in really high profile research opportunities and grow leadership in various sec um, sectors. Um, and then there are the kind of sub themes within that about using technology to deliver for UK citizens, um, tackling global challenges of various kinds, including climate change, and biodiversity loss, uh, transport systems, healthcare. Um, and there's some discussion in particularly in defense around border protection. Um, and, and then there's also aspirations here about um, government procurements and whether or not these kinds of technologies can be used for smart or sometimes described as smart government. So leveraging, for example, the public sector's capacity to create demand for AI and markets for new services, um, including by leveraging, for example, public procurement um, to support business to develop new technologies. So those are some of the common themes that I'm seeing. Um, there are also some common challenge priorities. So none more clearly stated than in the, than in the, in the new Office of Science Technology strategy documents. And these are um, in kind of fairly, fairly kind of familiar areas. I don't think there's anything here that would be a massive surprise to anyone in the room, um, but they are around sustainable development. So these are issues around um, natural environment conservation, sustainable use of natural resources, adaptation to climate change, reduction of contamination and pollution, a reduction of carbon emissions and transition to clean energy. And in the health and life sciences, we see uh, focus on issues for AI and data science like prevention and prediction of disease and mortality, uh, medicinal advancement and treating diseases, so vaccines, uh, healthcare systems and data improvement within that um, and promoting healthy lives and healthy starts to life as well. And national security and defense, um, we're seeing a drive towards translatable global security, counter-terrorism systems, predictive and informative real-time data systems, quite a lot of emphasis on that, um, and equipping and improving defense and security technology through data science. But I, I should also say that I'm, a phrase I'm hearing a lot at the moment is dual use. So aspirations of, 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 of kind of developing technology and platforms, which yes, could be used for security and defense, but would also be able to be used for civil engagement as well. So I, I've sensed that that's, that's a really important opportunity that we mustn't overlook. And then the last one there is a digital and data-driven economy. So this is challenges around um, technology, capability and infrastructure for new and emerging technologies, uh, data science and AI for prosperity, productivity in the economy, and policy making, regulation, and improve public access. Um, and I think it's worth noting here that, in fact, you know, UKRI has a key role to play in helping to build the infrastructure within which um, these challenges can be addressed by the research community specifically. And, and, and it's interesting to note that they've committed publicly to supporting the AI and data science, science sector and the adoption of AI as laid out in, the, for example, the National AI Strategy. Um, through a number of key activities. So, for example, by um, developing AI for use in key application areas, in responsible and trustworthy AI, in regulation standards. They're also, they've also stated <coughs> that they will support the ecosystem, this whole ecosystem that, that are kind of being drawn out through these threads 
through support for people and skills, interdisciplinarity and key infrastructure, so for example platforms, and by helping to build new capacity, so supporting new capabilities to address cross-cutting challenges, adventurous research, um, kind of strong basis of theoretical foundations, and, that, and again, work at that discipline interfaces. So I've, I'm quite optimistic, I think, that the AI review um, that happens, many of you know, happened within the UKRI sort of a year, 18 months ago, which has resulted in these commitments, them going public with these commitments. I, I, I feel quite confident that we're going to really start to see, now that the UKRI financial settlement um, following the CSR, has been um, has has been communicated that we're now going to start to see the increasing number of calls between maybe between now and Christmas, which will support these kind of commitments and uh, and ambitions. And and then so so what next? I was thinking as a final note. Um, so these are just some some nice pictures of all activities that JJ has been involved in over the over the last uh, couple of years. And I focused on in person ones because that's what I'm excited about. Um, I think. Yeah, we've got a real opportunity over the next year. This is my sense anyway, as we as we hopefully are moving away from a from a, a kind of pandemic mode of, of living and working and towards uh, and a kind of a new a new landscape for data science in the eye with some new funding opportunities and new engagements on the horizon. Um, I think I think we have some real opportunities as a as a research community to to help in Bristol to drive some of those agendas. Um, I mean, particularly around um, what one might call explainable AI or communicable AI. I think, I think that there are going to be quite specific multidisciplinary opportunities, both in terms of academic, academic, but also in terms of academic external partner, um, because, there's a, I'm sure that, that, that I'm sensing from all these strategies and the, the working and guidance documents from these other organizations, a realization that we need to be able to communicate what we do. We need to be able to co-produce our projects. Um, and we need to be able to drive decision-making in a, in a sustainable way that maybe is not reliant on any particular individuals, but where we can have kind of continuity of knowledge and understanding within organizations and, and none of that is, is um, a straightforward, but there is some great research going on at Bristol. Uh, for those of you who are at the showcase uh, last week, you would have heard Torty Civil's talk right at the beginning of the, of the program, where she was you know, describing some really exciting research that she's doing specifically around you know, explainable, what is explainable AI? What do we need it to be? And how can we generate um, principles, concepts and vocabulary which allow, would allow a wide, a wide a range of people as possible to have an understanding, uh, but also to participate in the development of, of, these, of these technologies at a, at a really fundamental level. So thanks very much everybody for coming. I hope this has been a little bit interesting, a little bit useful. Um, do keep in touch with us. I think, I'm not sure if we've got time for, for questions. I'll hand over to Chiara for comment on that. Um, but it's really great to be able to, to kick off Data Week with some of these reflections over this very crowded landscape. And also, I hope to give you a sense of the kind of work that JGI does and why we're so excited about the year to come. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kate. We do actually have a couple of questions if um, we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, let's go. Um, one of them, oh, it's in the chat box, I think. Uh, oh, hang on, I'll stop sharing. And then maybe I can see some faces. Great, I'll just put them into the chat box. I can see one. What level of researcher do you provide support to? PGRs, postdocs, ECRs, etc. Et okay, I'll, I'll quickly answer that one. So um, we have different, different um, calls for all of those categories of, of people. Um, for PGRs, we have our PGR sequel funding. We also work with PGRs sometimes to develop workshops. Um, and so the, P so the, the PGR CCORN funding happens once a year. Um, we haven't finalized the date of the next call. This call was um, very early in the calendar year. Uh, so it may, be, it may be the same rhythm next year. 
Um, but if you have specific uh, questions about that, let us know. We also have a PGR intern team. So we have a, a small group of, of PGRs that we recruited through an open call this year who are kind of paid interns within the JGI who get experience of the work of JGI, get experience of that multidisciplinarity and help with some of our JGI, ask JGI queries as well. Um, so yeah, we're really happy to, to support PGRs. Um, postdocs, early career and onwards through the career group, uh, we have you know, lots of opportunities um, for them, sequel funding projects. Anyone can join one of our hackathons, for example, so we are, we are agnostic in the sense in terms of in terms of research. We're ho hopefully open to as many sort of many people from as many um, stages of career progression as, as possible. I'm just looking at the chat for the next question. At what stage in a project life cycle should we engage with the JGI, either as academic or potential industry partner, if we're interested in collabor collaborating? Um, so, so one answer to that question would be as early as possible. <laughs> so that you can talk to us about your aspirations for the project and we can maybe provide a bit of guidance for you. Um, the other answer to that question would be, you know, when you've got an issue that you don't feel you can resolve, that may be the point where it's useful for you to get in touch with us through us at Ask JGI so that we can actually resolve that problem with you and put in, put in, put in process some maybe milestones for activity or boundary conditions for a particular J, um, in data science part of your project. Um, and our collaborations, as you can see, take many forms and have different kinds of funding. And we do need that external funding to have embedded data science activities from the JGI into your project. But we can work together, for example, to put grants in. Um, we can do costings for you and that kind of stuff to try and make that um, as simple as possible. Um, okay, that, I think those are the those are the two questions we've got. So we're bang on time. Fantastic. In which case, I shall say thank you so much for joining us. It was um, really fun for me to be able to kick off the day, and I hope you have a great week. Um, please let us know what we've missed in Data Week. Please let us know what you'd like next year always looking for looking forward to be able to build some new opportunities together so um have a great few days and uh, look forward to seeing you at another um, another event i'm going straight over to the rosh one see you soon bye